Hi, welcome to Regal Heights Church on the Couch. We're happy you're here with us again this week. We hope your new year has gotten off to a great start. Uh, again, we're going to offer you our free gift that we got for Christmas for you, and we're going to offer it again. It's called Right Now Media, and it's got thousands of videos, um, devotionals, Bible studies, kids' videos and kids' shows, kids' movies, everything for everyone in the family. So I'll put a link in the comments below, and uh, we invite you to partake in that. So we thank you for joining us. We thank you again for supporting us so that we can come into your homes for Church on the Couch. Uh, we do miss seeing everyone in person, um, but we do get to see some of you, in which uh, we love that too. So uh, let me just quickly pray really quick for us so that we can ask for God's blessing on this service. Dear Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the people who have come together to make this happen. We pray that your blessing would be upon uh, Regal Heights Church as we reach out to our community. And I pray that you would reach out to the hearts and minds of those who are watching right now. We thank you for providing the funds that we need uh, to continue our work and to continue reaching out to our community. Father, we thank you for everything that you do for us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So thanks so much for giving. And if you want to contribute as well, you can email us an e-transfer to Regal Heights office at gmail.com. And uh, we just thank you and we're um, happy you're engaged in our videos. And we'd love to connect even more with you. God bless you. Enjoy the service. Stop, 
You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never.
is plentiful Where your streams of abundance flow Blessed be your name Blessed be your name I found in the desert place Though I walk through the wilderness Blessed be Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. The sun shining down on me. The world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Suffering, but this pain in this offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away. Choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, O oh Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in. Still I will pray, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. What are the marks of a disciple? Hi, welcome back to Church on the Couch. We're so glad that you have tuned in with us here as we worship our Lord and Savior in the year 2021. Uh, we look forward to seeing what we can do as God's disciples to uh, become better students of His. Uh, 
When in fact here today, I'm going to be teaching a little bit of what God expects of a disciple and how we should go about life here on the earth. Now, this is not going to be a list of do's and don'ts from a morality point of view, but the marks of how, what is a disciple, how uh, does a disciple view the world, and how we should go out uh, doing what we are asked to do. And so this is much more on the purpose of a disciple. So this is the end of a, three, a quick three-part series on understanding the church, uh, what does the church do, and two, uh, the second one last week, which was what does a pastor do, the leaders within a church, and then today, what does the disciple do, and what does God expect of us, as we all participate in God's church, which is his invention, and we are told in scripture that the church is his body made up of many parts, and in that part, there's a living, breathing, spiritual organism that is the church. And it is made up of disciples, uh, and everyone's a disciple, including the leaders, but everybody has a place. There's eyes, there's ears, there's hands, and there's feet. We all have a place uh, and a role in Christianity to uh, move the church into the direction that it will go. Some of us have parts that are very visible, like on a human, the nose is probably the most prominent, uh, whereas uh, something that is seen the least is likely the feet, but we wouldn't get anywhere without our feet. Well, thank God for those who hold up the church so that others can get out and preach the gospel. We do this together as one unit, as one team. That's what the church is, is the body of Christ, one team with many parts. And you play an integral part. Yes, you do. And so really what I want to start out with here uh, today with this is to define what is a disciple? Well, first, a disciple, the, the word literally means a disciplined student. And so that means that we are deciding to become disciplined student, which means learning uh, from Christ, and in such a way that means that we're his pupil. So it's not just that we're learning intellectual things from him, it's that we are learning uh, the truth from him, we are learning wisdom from him, and we are learning how to live and how to operate. That is what that means. We are apprenticing under Jesus Christ. That is what a disciple uh, means in the root of the word. But a disciple is somebody who has first received the call to salvation and have followed Jesus Christ. We learn in the book of Matthew chapter 5 and elsewhere that uh, Jesus simply goes up to a number of people and says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That was to a couple of fishermen. And so then they ended up following him. So Jesus makes the call. You know what? Jesus works on the heart of every single person who ever comes to him. But the person must answer the call. And so when we answer the call, that's the first step in becoming a disciple, is receiving salvation through Jesus Christ and no one else. So that is the first step, and that is the only thing that is required to make you to become a Christian. But to become a disciple, to actually fulfill that and walk that out, we need to make sure that we uh, walk it out with Jesus. Now, that does not mean there's two classes of Christians, like there's just the Christian who does nothing and then a disciple who does something. No, we're all supposed to be discipled. But whether we do that good or whether we do that poorly, we are still saved if we have received the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And yes, it is right for us to question our own life that if we care not for the words of Jesus, did we really believe in his salvation in the first place? And, uh, but with that, let us not believe that you can become a Christian and then therefore do nothing and think that is okay. So we are disciplined, we are called to be disciplined students. Receive Jesus Christ and his free gift of salvation is number one. Then as we uh, seek his word as documented in the scriptures for us, that we have his words to teach us what to believe, how to view the world, and what to do about it. And so as we follow the example and teaching of Jesus Christ, it enables us uh, to know the right way to view the world, which is what I'm going to be getting into my next point just after this last definition. A disciple has also the Holy Spirit. Though we have the example and teaching of Jesus Christ, we also have the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. There is no separate indwelling later. It is a possession thing. You know, if we belong to Christ, then guess what? Then he has us. So we belong. That's why we say that we are a possession of God. Therefore, we are possessed by God. That may sound a little odd in the way we use the word possessed, but we are God's possession when we come to him and trust him in salvation. In the same way, the items in your house are your possessions. So guess what? Uh, we, the Holy Spirit has us more than we have him when you look at it that point of view. So the Holy Spirit is in everyone. Now, we understand that the Holy Spirit manifests in different intensities based upon the circumstance that we are in. So sometimes we get an extra filling or extra power in a certain time or ministry. But that does not mean that we did not have him before. We have the Holy Spirit from the moment that we believe. 
Yes, you do. And so as we, as we go about that, that helps us understand that, that we need that help to be able to live like Jesus. Because if Jesus was perfect and we are not, how are we on our own strength ever going to be able to follow his example and teaching? God knew that we would need the omnipresent, omnipowerful, uh, all-knowing God to lead us in that via the Holy Spirit. And so next is that it's important for us to understand how to look at the world. So it's one thing to be a disciple, but when we look at the teaching and the example of Jesus, we need to look at the world the way that he did. And he viewed the world as that it was broken and he came to fix it. So he testifies that everything was created through him and that it was made perfect. But then through sin, humanity botched this creation and has left it into the world in the way that we see it, where it is broken. When you see forest fires, when you see hatred and evil, and we see uh, earthquakes and even stars falling from the sky, meteorites, uh, all of that is a sign of decay from a once perfect world that God created and is evidence that we have botched his creation. He came to pave the way to fix sin and then promises to fix it in our lives and in heaven evermore. So now these dusty roads of, of this world will remain for a while yet because they serve as an example, as a reminder that humanity has sinned against God. So the reason why suffering still remains in the world is we must see what we have done. In the same way that you take a child to the mess that they have created so they may see what has happened and then you help them through it. Is the same way why suffering still exists. It's a very difficult thing, but it is, unfortunately, it's necessary for us to be confronted with the error of our ways. But we have a loving God who is going to save us through that. So that means we need to expect that there's going to be difficult things still happen in the life of Christians. And so our worldview is just that, that the world is broken, that God will lead us through it, not necessarily rescue us from every pitfall that we see, but that he's going to parent us through every situation, good or bad. And what God wants of a disciple, that worldview, is to be able to persevere, to lift up our heads, and to be able to take whatever challenge God gives our way. Because the challenges that we face may not be curses. They may be learning experiences that God is giving us to up our wisdom so that we can be useful, more useful, for his Holy Spirit in a day and age such as this. And if a disciple is going to be somebody who is a part of the body of Christ and that the body of Christ is supposed to be able to testify into the world, uh, a very dark and difficult world, then we need to be tough. So not only do Christians need to be uh, trusting God and committed, we need to be tough. Did you know that it is a difficult thing to be a Christian simply because of the outward pressures that get put on a person like that? So we need to be tough so that we may persevere. And the best way that we will persevere is not through uh, our prayers that God answers every comforting prayer that we ever ask of him. That would just make us spoil brats. But it is to us to always trust the scriptures, to trust God, no matter the circumstance we find ourselves in, because it, uh, our circumstances can blind us and lead us away from God. Consider Peter, when he saw Jesus walking on the water, asked to go out too. And he was successful until he took his eyes off Jesus and was looking at the waves. Then he sunk. In the same way, in flight school, our uh, pilots are taught to trust their instruments over their instincts and over what they see. There have been many planes that have been brought down over the years, particularly in uh, long ago times without such good instruments, that people thought they were pulling up, but they were pulling themselves down into the ocean. Many crashes have happened because people were disorientated because of the blue sky and the blue sea and didn't know up from down. Well, there's going to be times in your life that this world, from your visual standpoint, that it's going to seem uh, you're not going to know up from down. You know what? I've lived in those circumstances where you wonder where God's at. You wonder what you're seeing and how on this earth this could possibly be reality. Sometimes you might have pieces of your life. You're thinking, I never thought I'd ever come to this. That is when we take our eyes off of the situation and put them onto our instrument, the Bible, and we trust the instrument. Not in a naive, brainwashed way, but in a trust sort of way. The reason why pilots so easily trust their instruments is because they're tried, tested, and true, and they can know that they don't even have to look out the window to get the plane to where they need it to go because the instruments just work so perfect because they have been so well-trained and have so much experience that they can do so with great faith moving into the future. In the same way, we must be willing and know the, the Bible inside and out so when the day comes that we can trust our instruments, the Gospels, that we can follow Jesus' example even in the middle of it, and that we can take our eyes off the worries of the problems in this world and continue to get the church where it needs to go. This culture of ours is very opulent. 
Nobody in history has ever lived even like a middle class Canadian. It is really incredible the, the, the luxury that we have. And the love of that luxury has actually permeated into the church. They expects people to think that now that, okay, uh, I'll pray and follow God if I get my comforting things that I want, if I get the promotion. If I get to score the big deal, if I can get the girl, if I can get this, if I can get that, then I'll follow God. And we expect things to go right all the time in our lives because we are Christians. If we expect everything to go right from a material point of view in the world, then we are failing as disciples and need to correct course. So even people who don't profess the prosperity gospel, and the prosperity gospel is that, is it like God owes me a comforting life. Now God will give us lots of great blessings and we will enjoy them but we are not to expect them or demand those from God, that he gives them to us as he sees fit. And he also allows us to have difficult times so that we may grow. But a lot of people do not want to receive the negative aspect of God's teaching, which by the way is positive. Um, we just want to be good all the time. That's not how our Heavenly Father is going to raise us. But that teaching of that prosperity gospel has infiltrated many churches. I know lots of people who have said, I don't believe in the prosperity gospel. But then when they lose their job, they get upset when somebody speaks bad about them. They get upset and wonder where God is. When somebody breaks a relationship with them, they wonder how on earth could God ever let that happen to them. And yet, we need to be basing our life on what Jesus has taught us. His teaching and example is taught through Scripture. What do we learn in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11? Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, that's something that we need to understand. You know what? It is not pleasant to have somebody uh, call you down for something you did that is right. But did you know that they're actually buying you treasure in heaven? And by the way, that only stands for when you're doing something good or when you're actually innocent. If you're being mean and then somebody insults you, well, guess what? You deserved it. And uh, there's no heavenly reward for that one. But if you, because of Christ, uh, are changing the way that you live and are being honest and you're serving him and somebody still uh, persecutes you, they shut you out, they mistreat you, you need to know that you did not get demoted. Even though here on the earth you might have uh, lost a few things, you have gained a hundredfold in heaven. And that lasts forever. You know, that's why Jesus warns, don't worry about all the things of this world. You know what? Moth and rust destroys. Build yourself up treasures in heaven, as we learn in the very next chapter in Matthew. That he wants us to have our focus on heaven and that a knot of here on the earth, which is so temporary, which is so fleeting, and is easy to have things disappear. And so if you expect everything to go right in your life, you just might be a prosperity gospel believer. But if you were willing to realize that God is going to work, that you can rejoice, actually, it says the command is to rejoice, not tolerate. You know what? Don't take it so bad when people talk bad about you because of me. No, he says rejoice. Rejoice. Because Jesus is going to be very proud of you when he looks you in the eye and says, you took one for me. Someone mistreated you because of me. Come, let me bless you for that. Thank you for standing up for me. Thank you for believing me and showing them that you love me. That is going to be an incredible moment. And if you can just envision you doing that, having Jesus look you in the eye when you get into heaven and he tell you that of every circumstance, man, what would you do? You'd rejoice. I feel like rejoicing right now just thinking about that. Like rejoice when somebody speaks ill of you because of your faith or because you did what is right. They might attack you and do wrong things to you, but man, you have just gained so much more in heaven. Like, this is a very important thing for us to understand, is how much more there is in heaven and how much longer that will last. It's going to be incredible. Consider the apostles Peter and John, who were hauled before the authorities and were chastised for about their preaching of the gospel. They were upset because Peter and James were telling about the gospel and how Jesus was executed, and it made them look bad, and they didn't like that they were the ones being accused. And they didn't like how it was disrupting their power and prestige that they have enjoyed because many people started following Christ, which meant they weren't paying too much attention to these other guys. And they loved their position more than they loved God. And so they beat Peter and John. And they sent them out saying, don't preach this any longer. You know what they did? It says they ran out of there rejoicing because they got to experience disgrace for the name of Jesus Christ. So clearly by being with Jesus and hearing those words that Jesus taught that I just taught you, that they believed that so much and understood that so much that they thought that that was worthy. They'd just been beaten. Can you imagine being whipped a bunch of times and then being in a good mood? These guys were like, man, we face disgrace for the name. This is it. Like we're like... Like, in their view, that's how you get up in Christianity is by how low the world treats you. 
Uh, that's not exactly the truth, uh, but the point of this is that is that they were willing to face disgrace for the name of Jesus Christ, and they considered what they knew was going to be awaiting them to be incredible in heaven. And they also knew that, that must have meant that they were a considerable threat. Just these simple fishermen who were preaching about Jesus Christ had upset the highest of the high. So the next time that you find that somebody has been unnerved or threatened by you, uh, well, that lets you know that they're worried about you. And that really tells you that, that you are more important in their life than you would care to think before. Think about that. If somebody has the time to persecute you, that means they perceive you as powerful. See, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And when we preach the gospel, it does things uh, that push people to make a reaction. Nobody will ever be neutral on Judgment Day. Everybody has made a decision. Everybody will make a decision before then to uh, either align with Jesus Christ or to reject. We can do so passively or we can do so actively, but nonetheless, a non-decision is still a decision. This is why we encourage everybody to be a disciple. It is a wonderful thing. And another part about a disciple's worldview is that we are not our own. If God wants to spend our life and take us home to heaven now, then we rise to the challenge. Many disciples would end up losing their lives because of the name of Jesus Christ in a very untimely and horrific way. And they rejoiced that they got to be able to go to heaven that way by even their last moments not giving up on their Lord and Savior. So it's important for us to see that. Like, you know, even in the United States, uh, our sister country to the south, we, in their, their American Coast Guard, they have an unofficial motto, which is, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. And that really is the motto for all of our first responders. When someone is in danger, they will go and they will help, not knowing that they will ever be able to go home themselves. In the same way, the Christian is called into the world to serve Jesus Christ in this world and proclaim the gospel message. So we are to pursue holiness and get the gospel that came to us out from us. And sometimes, in many places of this world, it is very dangerous to do so. And we don't go out because we know we're going to come back in comfort later. We go out because we know that we are told to, and that if that's the last time we go out, we know that the next place we will be is in heaven. We must be courageous. If you, to be a real disciple is to be a courageous person, willing to lay it all down for Jesus Christ. And so this is why we teach these things, is so that we can have the confidence to know that when the world is at its worst, the church can be at its best, because the church is the living being of Christ here on the earth, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and filled with many great people that make up that one body. And as we work as a team together under the power of the Holy Spirit, under the headship of Christ, this gospel that has come to us is going to go out from us in power. We might get ridiculed along the way. We might get blessed along the way. Who knows? We just know that we're going to be faithful and we will leave the results of how we are treated and how things go. We're going to leave all that up to God. That is because we trust in Him, because we trust the instruments, and we trust Jesus Christ for salvation. And so if we continue to do these things together, and it's important that we do them together because we must encourage each other. This is why we're called to be a body, a part of a body. There is no use of a hand cut off from the body and laid aside somewhere else. So is the same way as the Christian who is not a part of a team. The team is what makes you really come alive. It is where you're really gonna see the Holy Spirit in action. This is why in the coming weeks and months, I'm going to begin a leadership training course. We're going to be teaching real doctrine. We're going to be dealing with some real hard truths in Scripture. And we're going to be training up people to be leaders uh, in many different ministries and even leadership here at the church. And so there'll be more details on that to come. But we need to up some of our training and the path for people to come in from when they come to salvation to have a plan of attack all the way through up into sending people out to share the gospel message. Because you know what, when the world is at its worst, the church needs to be at its best. I'm going to say that until you get sick of me saying it. And then we are going to continue to do so because, you know what, this is an exciting thing to be a part of. When the world is being shaken, and it is, people are looking to and fro on where to put their hope now, that things that they previously put their hope on have failed. And that people need to see us standing on the rock, trusting our instrument and getting our bearings from him. See, and I hope that this helps you to understand, most of all, what God expects of you in a good way. What you can expect from God as well, too, because our worldview, how we view the world, is going to affect many great decisions. If, if we get a little bit off in this prosperity gospel, we are not going to understand what God is doing in our life, and we're going to be miserable, and we're probably going to stop being part of the team. But if we can see the world through God's eyes, and if we can go at it the way that He said that the world is going to go, then we can have confidence that even in the most difficult of days, in our personal lives or in the world, that God is still there if we just trust the instruments. 
So I pray that your spiritual eyes would be opened and that the troubles of this world would just simply fade away, knowing that the glory of God is around you, that he is pleased to give you his Holy Spirit, that for the joy set out before him, he endured the cross and didn't even worry about the scorn or the shame that he had about taking our place on the cross. So therefore, we should have no shame in going out and proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. How could we ever keep this message to ourselves? And to know that when you do go and share this message, you know, it, it's the most simplest of message and the Holy Spirit promises to superintend every time. You are never going at it alone. So whether it be your family or your friends, I just encourage you to share, even as simple as the woman at the well. She didn't know how to preach. She wasn't very wise. She couldn't even pick up what Jesus was alluding to until the very end. And then she simply went back to her village and said, listen, come meet the man that told me everything that I, I ever known about myself. And then people went. So sometimes you don't need to be the most eloquent preacher. You don't need to know, we should know the gospel inside and out, but you don't need to, to invite somebody else. We can invite someone to someone else. I remember the first time when I came to church and I came to faith, I couldn't articulate it, but man, well, I just kept bringing people to the pastor because I knew he could do it. And, uh, and it worked for quite some time. Well, then when the pastor left, I was like, well, now what am I going to do? So I had to learn it myself and I had to have the courage to go out and do so. So yeah, while we are training people up to be able to share their faith, I encourage you to share messages like this uh, and other videos that we may have to other people so that the gospel can get to them as well. Be courageous. Jesus was courageous for you. He was courageous for me. It is our turn to do the same. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, and God, I just thank you that you do care so much about us that you want to empower us. That, Lord, that you've given us a trusted instrument document and you've given us the example of your Son. Oh, Father, we just thank you that we can trust this and that, Lord, that we don't look at the world the way that the world does. Uh, Lord, we do pray that you would give us your eyes so that we could see in every situation that when we think that we're upside down or upside right, that you would, uh, through your instrumentation, through your words, that you would lead us into the proper course of action in that time where we feel topsy-turvy. God, I pray that you could use us and unite us to a body of, of you in a church, Lord, that we could use our gifts and grow in those gifts so that your message can go out to the world. God, help us to grow in our personal holiness. Lord, help us to not just follow your teaching on what to do to others, but Lord, on what we should do uh, introspectively to our own lives. Lord, help us to forego the sins that so easily trip us up. Help us to love you more and uh, be naturally more obedient to your commands. So Father, we pray that you would continually make us holy as we continually want to see your name be known by everyone here on the earth. So Lord, as we finish this simple series on your church, your invention, your body, your people, God, I pray that we could be united in strength, empowered by your Holy Spirit, and sent out into a world that desperately, desperately needs you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in to Church on the Couch. Uh, we have opened up with a fair amount of restrictions on a Sunday morning as well, too. We'd love for you to get connected with us if you haven't done so already. So either show up on a Sunday or give us a call or an email, and we'd be happy to help you take your next steps with the Lord Jesus Christ in becoming a disciple and growing in your discipleship. Well, God bless you as you go. Have a great day.